Let's just make him a make him a panelist. If not, um, it's a G, so you'll find him under under G under Glenn. It's been a while since I talked to. Oh, I see. Now that I'm looking at all of the attendees, what's up, Gary? I see you, Ashton. I see Ruth. Uh, do me a favor, Glenn. If you're on there, just say hello so we can identify you and then make you a panelist. Because for some reason, we didn't say... see in Australia. You don't get the Zoom links we send you. That's the problem. You guys do everything upside down over there. Oh, you did. All right. All righty. Now I can work, make fun of him. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? <laughs> I How said, I said the reason we didn't send you the link is because American links don't work in Australia. You, I'm joking. You, it was a joke. It was a joke. It was a joke. Really? Nah, he's, he's having to lend me the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. What's up, man? <laughs> Good to see you, man. Been too long, brother. Thanks. Although, but you know what? It doesn't feel like it's been too long. It's too long since since you know we've done anything other than swap messages. But every time I'm watching you on video, man, it's like, yeah, Tristan gets it. And isn't it funny how communication isn't one on one, and yet mm -hmm. there's still a sense of feeling it when you commute. I suppose when you communicate the way you do to the camera, it's like you're talking to your audience member. It's not like you know, it, it's not like you're broadcasting on the news. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're so right, that's man. probably why. It's a one, it's a, even though it looks like it's a one to many, it really is a one to one communication. Correct. Yeah. That's how that's, but it's funny, man. You mentioned that and uh, we're not live yet, are we? Or are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are. We're it's just... all part of the training. Cool, brother. Yeah, well, cool. Tell you, this, this is a good point. One to many, because I do the same thing as you do. I communicate to that camera as if it's one of my friends, like I'm doing with you now. And, 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 and I do that with everything. So I was at an airport not so long back and this guy comes up to me, Glenn, man, it's so good to see you. Man, that thing we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, blah, 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 blah. And I had my son with me, right? My, my um, 13 year old son, he was at the time. And as I walked away, we had this good communication. How's biz? He told me about this thing that he was doing that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. I'd never spoken to the man. We were on a mm. video. He was on a video where I was talking to a hundred agents. And yet the way he communicated with me was, that thing we were talking about, I went and didn't want to share with me his results as if I was having a one on one with him, mm. but I wasn't. But because of that manner of communicating one to many as if one to one, it's a really cool principle for building a relationship with an audience, man. And you do it better than anyone I've ever seen, brother. So I really appreciate cool. that, man. Well, look, it's been a while since I saw you. For those of those uh, people listening in, you're from Australia. You, I can't tell you're like uh, <laughs> the audio. <laughs> well, you know, you may be living here, but you're not. You're living True. down under. It's like <laughs> it's 8 a.m. I think over there, right? Yeah, it and, is. Yeah. And you, you've been doing real estate on a coaching level for for a long time. You're you're very you're a recognizable person over there, and you do a very good job. We we go back a long time and. Can you tell people exactly what you do and how you got into real estate over there? And then we'll get into the details. Yeah, yeah. The lightning fast, uh, lightning fast version is got in the industry, hated prospecting cold calls, then studied every marketing coach, primarily USA guys, because down in Australia, they didn't have anyone to teach me how to get a seller to call me so I didn't have to cold call a hundred people in the area to get one begrudging maybe you know, where they go, oh, well, if you must come around and give me an opinion of what my home's worth, I'll, I'll allow you to. Like, imagine going from that level of like begging for appraisal opportunities. That's what we call like a market opinion. Just the first step in the, in the process is that. And we go from begging for those. Then when we find someone who's selling, trying to reposition ourselves as an authority who's worth $15,000 for the transaction, that mm -hmm. formula I despised. So I went and figured out, how do I get that one person to call me so I don't have to call them? And for the last 15 years, I've been honing, reinventing, uh, taking those principles from offline primarily to half offline, half social media, now to primarily online with a little bit of printed paper and ink. Um, oh, you know, yeah. newspapers, printed collateral, etc. But with the, even though the media might have twisted and changed over the course of the last fifteen years, the principles have not, and that is 
Position yourself as an expert authority in your area that when the marketplace thinks real estate, they think you, so that that one in a hundred people who might potentially need something in the real estate space, they instantly think of your name, your face, and, and they know how to contact you so that you don't have to go to the marketplace like a beggar and then try and flip the switch and say you're an expert. So, um, and I, of course, I met Tristan some years ago. I was honoured when he invited me to come over to Lab Coat Live in San Diego. I've had him speak at a couple of our events, uh, along with his partner Nick Baldwin. And you know, I, I just have the, uh, the one of the highest compliments I ever got. This summarises the Glen Twiddle story because we're going to get into how to help now. This summarises when Nick. And Tristan said to me over in San Diego, they had stars of million dollar listing there. They had uh, Aaron Brockovich was headline speaker. Amazing event, amazing event. I met some really talented folk there that I still look at to this day in terms of educators. Sharan, genius. You know, the, um, uh, the, the, the Facebook guys, there was a lineup that I was honored to just be amongst. And, but when Tristan and Nick at that event said that if you want to sort of sum up Glenn, he's the illegitimate love child of Gary Vaynerchuk and Tom Ferry. I think <laughs> throw in a bit of Dan Kennedy, the marketing legend, and that's probably about how to describe me. But when those guys said across between Tom Ferry and Gary V, I'm like, I'll take that, man. I'll take that. That's very true, man. So look, we're we're in a in an interesting world right now. Obviously, it's a proposed settlement. Nothing's been uh, officially ah. signed. So the the main two challenges that we're seeing is that the commission to the buyer's agent isn't going to be allowed to be placed on the MLS, mm -hmm. right? So it's no longer going to be there. And then it's up in the air as to who's going to pay for it because we can still negotiate it with the seller and the seller can still pay for it. But we're seeing is now the buyer saying, well, do I have to pay for it? And if so, how does that work? Because this is just starting to come out. So that means our, our lending world still hasn't figured out whether or not it works like in Australia where we can put it into the loan, to the financing. Um, so we're in the middle there. And then the other piece to this is now every single buyer that we work with has to have a buyer broker agreement signed before we show them property. Ah, so that wasn't the case historically. No, uh, okay, that's you're like, dude, we've been doing it like this for a long time. Yeah. So, 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 so no, I guess um, half of this conversation will be tr uh, Tristan bringing me up to speed with the nuances yeah. of who yeah. incurs a fiduciary obligation, what paperwork historically has been signed and all of that. Yep. So we're, I've, I've watched a few of Tristan's uh, so, philosophical takes on it and we're so in alignment with that. I love it. Um, so, so there'll be a little, so you've got to forgive me guys that Tristan's going to bring me up to speed a little yep. bit, but it, I do get the sense that the way we've been doing it will be a way, potentially not the only way, but a wow. way for some agents over there to move forward. You got and, it. Um, yeah, so, so, take, so definitely. Take us through. Mm. Now, mm. if I'm a buyer in Australia, do I go through a buyer's agent? Do I go directly to the seller? Yeah, and what are, the, what are the fees involved using a real estate agent for the buyer? Yeah. So let me give you the overview of how real estate is typically transacted here and the quick version of the paperwork and the written agreements of who signs up with whom and who incurs. And I think this is where the 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 the, the country, whoever the, the body is that took this class action is coming from, is who incurs the fiduciary obligation to represent who. And so, because that's the big thing, that duty of care at law, at least here in Australia, and I assume, because I have heard you use the term fiduciary obligation, and I'm glad, because one thing I didn't want to get in the way of this conversation is terms that we use. We don't even use the term broker. Our brokers over here are called principal licensees. So they're the effective business owner. They're the one who actually has the relationship with the seller at law. And then salespeople who work for that broker, we call it principal licensee, are like an arm and an extension of that broker, of that principal licensee. Yeah, it's the same. That, that actually is That's the same the here. Same? Cool. Yeah. So when, a, when you're a buyer and you want to buy a piece of real estate, there is still the legal mechanism to engage a buyer's agent. So we still have that where... You sign a agency agreement to represent the buyer to go and source properties. So the fiduciary obligation to that buyer is to source the property at the lowest possible price as yeah. the fiduciary representative of that buyer. So that's here, but it probably occurs one in 500 transactions. 
right? Less than 1% oh. of transactions that are affected in residential mum and dad type real estate here in Australia, which is primarily what most real estate agents play in. There's not too much, com there is commercial of course, but 40,000 real estate agents here in Australia, as opposed to maybe 400,000 in the States, for a rule of thumb, I always say is just stick a zero on everything that we do to talk to my US friends. And Dude, so, because I've heard there's a million, yeah, I've heard there's a million plus, but active ones, Tristan, I'm not talking about the guy oh, who's oh, got the yeah. license and is waiting tables. I'm talking about, you know, those who are doing pull it. Pull on, pull on. Gotcha. Yeah. And so say it's 400,000, so we got 40,000, like it, it would be less than 1% that do, you know, commercial real estate, just everyone gets in, gets their license and does residential mum and dad real estate so for those 99 percent of them even though the facility is to have a buyer's agent get remunerated by the buyer a seller's agent the way you do it be remunerated by the seller mm -hmm. and um and, and now i did do some investigating because i've only coached one buyer's agent historically so i rang him and then i talked to another couple just to make sure his way of doing business was the norm so our buyer's agents are remunerated separate to the uh, the um, the proceeds and things. Sometimes they do it in installments. So there'll be a, an engagement fee, potentially a retainer on a weekly basis. And then when a sale is affected, those initial fees, either initial engagement fees or retainers in an ongoing way, do mm. go against the commission and pay it back kind of thing. But if there is no sale that happens, those upfront fees are collected and retained by the buyer's agent who is representing the buyer. So oh, that's but, an interesting but, way. It's yeah, like but, here, we're, yeah. we're taking it up front, we're charging, and then as soon as we close over here, then it's paid off. It all gets and deducted, yeah. Deducted. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I like so, that. Now, but so I few do it that way, Tristan. And that doesn't help your, like, say it's 2% no. of a $400,000 property. That's it's still. Very little. You know, that's still what what is that? Is that 10 grand? Dude, that is it's tiny. I, I yeah, it looks at eight grand if it's two percent yeah. of four hundred. Okay, yeah. so two and that's and again the, the commissions, we sort of are around the one to three percent on the buyer's agent side, two to three percent, one and a half to three percent on the seller's side. That's a typical agency fee with a median that, price of around five hundred thousand dollars. Is that how it typically works every time? So there's always a buyer, for the most part, a buyer's agent involved? No, no, there's never a buyer's agent. That's what I'm saying. What never. I just described That's to you legally saying. happens less than 1% of transactions. That's in what so I it's almost okay. not worth talking about, but it is there in at law. It is there okay. at law and it does happen. So then typically, the reg if I was going to go buy in Australia, oh, my friend Dan, my friend Dan is going to actually go buy in Australia. Cool. Dan He's, from Australia. He's from Australia. I'll connect him to you. Wait, what yeah. part of Australia are you in? Uh, but I've got clients all over the country. So, so even though, and, and it is getting down to the fiduciary obligation, he shouldn't buy any of my clients' listings because they'll get him to pay top dollar. He should talk to my clients and friends and buy through one of their competitors who they identify as crap so he can get a good deal. <laughs> you know, you know Dude, what I mean? Sounds like a broken system. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is my clients have a fiduciary obligation that they will honor to get top dollar for their seller. So your buyer shouldn't buy against my clients as negotiators because they're good. I've got, a, I've got a friendship with you. I don't want your friend to pay too much. Seven yeah. out of 10 real estate agents here in Australia will be underskilled and your friend will out negotiate them. Buy through one of them. Me and Naomi just did. We bought a house. Literally, we paid about 15% less for that home. And without going into the specifics, worth probably mid sixes, seven. We paid, let's say, mid fives because we were negotiating against an absolute novice and we paid far less than we would have. All that person would have had to do is tell us the price when we said, sort of, you know, what do you reckon the owners will accept? If she'd have just said a number, we would have paid it. But her right. way of communicating that, we paid 15%, like nearly 100 grand less than we should have. What do you, and so I, I want you to answer this and I'm going to go back to the beginning of how to start this, but okay. if, if you just did this, what do you think would have benefited the seller more than having your representation, having you represented by an actual buyer's agent or? No, I was a better negotiator than any buyer's agent would be. Okay. So then of, what yeah. was the problem? Why did you end up negotiating less? Where was the problem? The agent said, when we asked, how much do you think the owners will accept? 
Here was some language before we were at contract, while we were expressing serious interest that we were going to put in an offer. Here was her words, and I quote, oh, thank God you guys came along and, and really saw through some of the visual shortfalls of this property. Um, geez, I'm really grateful. She expressed gratitude and told me firsthand we were the only buyers within a country mile who were interested in this property. Our offer instantly went down to bottom dollar, and then she went to her sellers and said, this is all we got, please accept it. Unbelievable. Wow. Got it. So no negotiation, no back and forth. No. Interesting. You know, we we find that over over here, this is the reason that some states don't have dual agency because of mm. that reason. Meaning, the listing agent can't represent the seller and the buyer in some oh, states. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that, and that's certainly one of the things when I saw because I heard um, some folk. I won't name names because I don't want to add to any trouble if they might be. But they use the term double ending. Yeah. Right, where they get both. Now, they told me they waived conflict or whatever language they used that both buyer and seller acknowledged it, thus keeping them out of legal dramas. But there's still, without that disclosure, how can you have a fiduciary obligation to both sides of a transaction with opposing best interests at heart, you know? Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest challenge we're facing here because the, the way the media is portraying it, and you help me, Glenn, but the way that they're portraying it is saying, well, now the buyer's can circumvent the buyer's agent in some cases and just go directly to the listing agent. Which they and, do in every case over here. Virtually. Yeah, we, we've seen that here too, right? We, we get calls all the time in, in similar situations. Mm. But as far as commission, because this is the norm, you said 90, 98% most, about? Most. All, most of our buyers all transactions. do not have a, because most Aussies, for whatever reason, and it is just a cultural acceptance by the, by the buying and the selling public. Most Aussies credit themselves with enough negotiating uh, a skill and ability that they don't need to pay one to three percent of the transaction fee in order to have themselves represented by someone trained to do this. Now, I'm not even saying that in most cases that a good negotiator couldn't do for a member of the public what me and Naomi did for ourselves with that yeah. lesser skilled selling agent. They absolutely could, because imagine yeah. if someone did represent us, saved us over $100,000 in our purchase price, charged us $8,000 to do so, happy Glenn, happy client, very, very acceptable transaction, you know? Yeah. But it just doesn't happen in most of the time because most buyers, they see a property they like, they inquire with the real estate agent. They're, the real estate agent doesn't overtly, they're not overtly required to say to every buyer that comes to inspect the property. Now you do realize I represent the seller and my job is to turn you upside down and squeeze you for your last dollar because I've incurred a fiduciary obligation. They don't say that, they just treat those buyers with courtesy, honesty, uh, fairness and respect. And in our law, it says uh, honesty, fairness and, um, fairness, honesty and, Maybe it's respect or something. Um, but there's three things that we just have to treat them fairly. We can't be deceptive and all of that. But that is our obligation to buyers. Our obligation okay. to sellers is get them the most money to, for their best interests. That's it. Got know. it. Got it. That yeah. makes sense. You have a contract so, with it. So, so then what? what is the commission amount typically charged on the listing side yeah, when you so take the it's, listing? Um, it's 1.5% for the lesser skilled agents, 3% for the good ones. Now, I do want to sort of bring to your, because uh, I've got a couple of solutions for you, for your guys, if everything seems to be along the right lines of how we've done business. And look, we've got agents that do millions of dollars in commissions, like millions, you know, multi, multi-million dollar agents. You know, we top out at about the $8 million for one agent. Like for an agent, is our best, I don't think they quite clip the $10 million. Um, uh, no matter really how big their team, where there's one solo agent, even if they've got not other agents, but other support staff, like you might've met, um, uh, you know, at, at various events of ours or something. Uh, there's one of my clients called Chris Gilmore. He went from 150,000 in commission when he met me to a million and a half when we worked for about five years together. You really as monthly, you know, coach clients and all of that. He's now since gone on, cause he's now, you spend five years with me, you know, everything I know. 
So he's gone on and, and built a team that's doing about four million, but he's got eight staff doing 90% of the work. It's almost like, right. not that he's ever read the book, but I read it and I sort of helped him apply some of these things. That book by um, uh, Gary Keller, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, first book Good. I ever read. And you know how yeah. he talks about you, you build a team and you build experts, so you're just the puppeteer pulling the strings. Well, Chris is one level below what Gary Keller talks about at The Ideal, where he does nothing but listing presentations. He's got staff to do everything else. But those staff are working on behalf of him. They're not a listing and selling entity in their own right. They are his okay. employees. Okay. And so, so, yeah. So he the, gets 3%. He gets 3%. He gets 3%. And then that also wraps in the buyers that they come in. They don't charge an extra fee for representing them. No, well, they don't represent them, and that's the key. They treat them fairly, honestly, and respectfully. They oh. help them figure out the paperwork, and they get their offer on a written contractual offer of sale and all of that. Mm. So they treat them with honesty and fairness and, you know, transparency and all of those things, but they do not represent them, and that's God. the key. That is the, the key. obligation is to seller and the, the buyer, whilst they are treated with friendliness, courteousness and respect, etc., they are, for the purposes of that negotiation, they are on the other side of the negotiating table, not at outside of the table. Got it. All right. So now you kind of understand where we're at. There's representation on both sides yeah. uh, on our end. Um, the, the way that the media has portrayed the real estate agent or the industry as a whole over the last few days it's just saying there are there's no more six percent commission. There never was, right? It's always been negotiable. Uh, and now you're finding that we're getting calls left and right to get a better understanding of how this is going to work. The point is nobody knows yet because, like I said, it hasn't it's even gone through, right? Yeah. So it's just it's just in the settlement phase. Mm. And what are some of the recommendations that you've seen with your world? as far as us being able to apply some of these. Hmm. Betty's just asked if Australia requires lawyers for yeah. real estate transactions. The, 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 absolutely. Um, so whether it's a full law firm, and really the full law firms don't charge full law firm fees. They know they couldn't get away with it. So they charge very reasonable fees to transact on properties. When I say yeah, reasonable, yeah, you know, the legals might be between $500 and $1,500 to pay for the lawyer's representation. In some states, they call them a settlement agent, so they're almost a pseudo lawyer. There's still legal minds in there, but they've figured out a way to do it without a fully blown $500 an hour Harvey Specter on the deal. Uh, you know, um, I'm maybe showing my age, talk about Harvey Specter or, or um, uh, Boston yeah, Legal, yeah. you know, but he had Denny yeah. Crane and stuff. <laughs> I am showing my age. Um, so, um, geez, I'm half only half dressed, Tristan. Um, so, uh, so yeah, to answer, um, to answer, it was a Rebecca, to answer Rebecca's question, yeah. um, they do require, uh, no, so yeah. there are legals in it that does protect the buyers from making a faux pas or the real estate agents from maybe incorrectly filling out the contract. But, but mm -hmm. that's part of really our, our licensing is learning how to fill out the contracts because we take a live contract and we get that signed back and forth between buyers and sellers. Then it gets submitted to the legal people. Got it. So we're. We, in essence, when we bring it, when the buyer comes in and says, I like this home, I'd like to offer this much, and that falls on us, we're now sending the paperwork back and forth between both parties. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's and what, that, that's, yeah. We do that, that but, but the other party isn't a represented real estate agent, they're the buyer. Got it, so you go directly to the buyer. Okay, so who's all involved in a transaction? You've got the listing agent, you've got an attorney, now for the transaction that, rep that represents the listing agent. Okay. And then who else do you have involved? Here? A buyer and a buyer's attorney, let's say they each pay maybe between 500 and $1,500. So only a thousand dollars here. No yeah. Buyer gets represented buyer by a attorney. lawyer for the purposes of the paperwork. It's after the negotiation is done. It's like a flat fee. It's like saying, yeah, it is a flat fee in most cases. Yes. Mm. Which has been that, by the way, that has been thrown around over on this end. One of the opportunities that, we're seeing some companies talk about is saying, well, why not have a flat fee service servicing all of the buyers and saying, hey, we'll we'll do the paperwork for you for five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. Exactly how it's done here. But but they and that lawyer does incur the fiduciary obligation to represent the buyer 
from a legal perspective to make sure they're not entering into an unfair contract and all of those things, but the contracts are standardized anyway. We use the same contracts mm -hmm. that were composed by the law societies over here to be fair and fact even a little bit biased in protecting the buyer's best interest, a little bit protective of the buyer's side, but we use those standard contracts in almost all cases. I like that. I like that. All right, some questions for you. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Glenn, Let me Glenn run you is... through these these couple of um, of um, solutions that I kind of sure. formulated in my in my head, and and let's see if they might uh, be be helpful. So one of the things, just like our society, our whole buyer and seller dynamics, they're trained to if they saw a six percent commission from an agent, selling agent. They'd instantly freak out and think, that's not what agents charge, right? And and similarly, the buyers are trained just to respond to, to properties. Like you said, happens from time to time with you guys. Buyers come straight to you. Um, and so we, our people are trained in a certain way, as are yours. Even though you're saying there's some people that are going to listen to the media and say, oh, 6% is over. It was never there. I can guarantee you that there's a whole lot of people who aren't watching that still think a real estate transaction costs 6%. So here's the first thing that I might suggest. Yep. If you said to your sellers, and I note that you're um, uh, recording this, so please review this, slow it down, chop it out, get the script, get the dialogue, tweak it and UIize it, make it your own, and then figure out how to deploy it. So it might be something like this. So Tristan, you're my seller now. Tristan, okay. um, thanks for choosing us um, you know, to represent you in this. I understand there's a lot of choices out there, so I'm honoured that you've chosen to leave the marketing and the negotiation of this property to us. With regards to our fees, we want to make sure that you get the best outcome at the end of the day and get the most money in your pocket to the tune of, you know, if a typical property of, say, $500,000, if there's a bit of leeway that with, you know, if you sell it yourself, there might be a 5% discount that a buyer might enjoy at your expense um, because of the lack of a marketing and negotiation system, but then you save your fee. So there might be 5 to 10% either way, in either direction, in terms of if you get the negotiation, the marketing and all of that right, a 10% premium on what this house is potentially worth, and a 5% to 10% discount if you've got to give it away based on price alone. So I'm honored that you've chosen us. And in order, I mean, surely that, that's definitely what you're after though, yeah? The most money in your pocket after all of that is said and done. Would that be fair to say? Right? Yeah. Because we want them to get a bunch of yeses, yeah? So we get a bunch of yeses along those lines. Then we say, so the way we do that, Tristan, is we're positioned in the marketplace a little differently than a typical real estate agency. So what you're engaging me to do is to market on your behalf to all of the buying public, get the, the, the property in front of as many eyeballs as possible, because we've got a formula that turns eyeballs into foot traffic at an open house, multiple mm. people falling in love with this property at that open house, leads with our negotiation system, this unique negotiation system that we've put together to get a premium price for you by having multiple people fall in love with that property, getting competitiveness against each other, thus getting you a premium outcome for you. And the way we do that is not only do we market to get the most eyeballs to get those buyers in, but we work with a selection of the best agents in the area. And we only choose the good ones who are, you know, because when we work with another agent, they along with me have a legal responsibility to get the most money possible for, um, uh, for, for you like think about this the agents that i work with that you've never met they have the same legal responsibility to represent you as i do and we get the most money possible out of their buyer if their buyer happens to be the one that is offering the most money myself and my colleague from another office and i've got a bunch, i've got a network of these guys in other offices all the best agents in the area and we work together to get you a premium price. So whether the highest price buyer that's out there, that emotional buyer who is moving to um, uh, to uh, Florida from LA, they're running from, they're, they're chasing Ben Shapiro over to Florida, or they're chasing Joe Rogan down to wherever Joe ended up, Austin or whatever, right? Yeah. So that person who is moving to Austin needs to buy in Austin. They've missed out on four or five properties because everyone's moving to Austin. And they want to live near the comedy club because they're an up and coming standard whatever we want to find that guy that is emotionally wanting to buy that property and have him know that there are other buyers that are wanting that property thus we drive him to pay a premium for your property and me and the agent you've never met are working on your behalf if that buyer is the one i've never met that buyer until the negotiation starts but mm -hmm. me and that other agent represent you 
I get it. Now, and, and what I'm sort of saying there is, whether it's with one of my network of referral specialists that is that emotional buyer, whether it's the buyer that comes to us directly through our advertising, which again, as you've seen, that's why you called me in because you see me everywhere marketing properties. And that does result in the lion's share of our buyer inquiry that comes in. But we don't want to discount the other agents. If they happen to be working with a buyer that this property, your property suits perfectly, of course they're welcome to bring them in and we remunerate them and it costs you nothing more. So what that, that relationship is called over here, a conjuncting relationship where we mm -hmm. work in conjunction with the um, uh, the sellers, uh, with the um, other agents on mm -hmm. behalf of the sellers. Now, typically, historically, when I owned my company, we had a no questions asked 50 50 conjuncting policy, meaning I'd okay. list them at, at say two and a half percent, and another agent would come in and we'd go one and a quarter percent each. Now, you can change the percentage once it's set with the sellers. The way it used to be, it would be written, the percentage with which we will conjunct with other agents would be written on our agency agreement. I saw some things in the lab coat where people were saying, oh, what about if you've got a friend and you offer him a 50-50, but you've got an agent that you don't like, so you offer him an 80-20. <laughs> My recommendation is have a standard split that's that no matter who it is, because the thing is, Tristan, when you get good at marketing properties direct to consumers, I saw David Knox say this to me 20 years ago. So this isn't a new concept even over there. When you market properties effectively to consumers, you're going to get buyers come to you direct, treat yeah. them with fairness, honesty, and professionalism. They will be your primary, you know, because think about it. If there's a buyer sitting on another agent's database, if they've been on there for a period of time, they're not the emotional buyer that needs to move this week. You need your marketing direct to consumers to put these properties in front of those buyers that ne that are moving next week and, and will buy next week because they're the ones that are going to pay the 10% premium. And if you're going to honor the fiduciary obligation that you incur at law, you can't have preference of your friend who you'll pay 50% or whatever if the guy who you don't like has got a buyer that will pay more. But yeah. in reality, the amount of times we conjuncted was less than one in 10 times. So yeah. nine out of 10 times, we got the buyer direct. So we got all of that 3% commission or two and a half percent was our standard. That's what we charge. We got all of the commission nine out of 10 times, but the unique selling proposition of being able to say to a seller, we'll work with all of the other agents and not, well, not only all of the other agents we've hand select. It's almost like Tristan, we haven't had an MLS in this country since I've been in real estate. There was one back in the eighties, I'm told. I've never wow. been, but I made my own informal MLS with all of the best agents in my area yeah, that whenever I would get a listing, like New I York. would send it to my colleagues. Yeah. And then, so it was an informal MLS. They knew the manner with which we conjuncted and they were happy to do it because they just throw me buyers. I remember one guy, I'd done a few conjunctions with him over the course of years. And one time we had a buyer of his booked and he something come up and couldn't attend the appointment. So he just sent the buyer. He did no work other than sent the buyer to this appointment. I did everything. And I sent him a $4,000 commission check for doing none of the work. Wow. Right? He never came to another buyer inspection with me again. He just sent me his buyers. And if ever any of them were the buyer, I'd send him four grand. It was a, a beautiful question. Thing. Yeah. about that there's so multiple questions here yeah. let's go like uh, I've, I've crammed a lot in bro. <laughs> yeah so there's no mls so over here we're, we're also hearing rumors as nar is having a challenge some mls's may pull out some stay right but there are also some brokerages the big ones are also talking about saying well why don't we create our own system where we can show what percentage we're paying to the buyers? Now, then what happens is you take this one place where we can go to find properties. And now there's a whole bunch of different ones, little ones, like what you're saying, hey, you created your own. Is there a disadvantage in, in your country where I would go to some smaller brokerage Put up my listing in a smaller brokerage and now it doesn't get the same representation so other agents can see it then i don't have the same foot traffic yeah um what was your well here's the your answer is direct consumer advertising we've been a bit spoiled over here in australia we had three or four years when i first got in the industry where i mastered direct consumer advertising 
Then mm. this website called realestate.com.au really took over and it became almost the MLS countrywide, meaning is that real no or no? I That's guess, yeah, it's same as realtor.com or what's the other one you've got where all the properties go to be advertised? Oh, that's Zillow. Zillow, oh. yeah. Yeah. So we've got one of them, right? Where lit And that's where the buyers go. We train buyers to go to realestate.com. Prior to that, we had to go to the radio, TV, newspaper, magazines. You know, primarily newspapers and magazines were the primary real estate media for exposure of properties to buyers. And so... In the ensuing 15 years, agents over here have lost the ability to market direct to consumers. Their ability to promote properties on Facebook for the most part, and I have seen that a fair bit. I did some study, man, when I was doing some work with Glenn Cortino in Beverly Hills. I was over there to um, interview uh, Josh Altman, Matt Altman, and Josh Flagg. Now that they're buddies, Tristan, I know we talked about this years ago, when Altman and Flagg hated each other, Flagg wouldn't even take my calls. But then when they got to be besties, I brought Josh Flagg out to Australia as well, now that they're friends. So I brought Altman's and, and Flagg, so it was pretty cool. But I was over there and I was talking to Glenn Cortino, who's a Beverly Hills real estate agent. He knows the Altman's and he, he's um, a you know, great example of an Aussie real estate agent. You know, he's, 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 he's wonderful. And so, you know, we were, um, uh, so where we go, you, what, what, your question was you asked about, is there a disadvantage and I was, uh, God damn, yeah, I was my train of thought. Small, as soon as small, I drop Altman, he fires my brain. <laughs> small brokerage. Yeah, is there a disadvantage? And because you guys have no MLS, it's Ah, all... yeah, so realestate.com. That, that's yeah. our, our, our biggest thing. So, so hold on, Glenn, in, because in, here's, in, the, here's the other fear we have, right? As, 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 a, as a big uh, group of agents, if you're telling me that realestate.com now has like the monopoly on where everyone goes and puts their website where properties on. Things. Correct. I mean, we're, we're, we're at the cusp of something like that happening even more, not just Zillow, but Redfin or other sites. Tell me, I need to understand the real estate.com thing. Do they charge agents an extra oh, fee yeah. or something? Ooh, what, ooh, how does ooh. that business model work? It and started much, off as, yeah, it started off as free. Or subscription. You pay your subscription, you put all your properties up, and they all go there. They are geniuses, Tristan. Because as soon as they got, as soon as we got the buying public addicted to this one portal, this one monopoly, they can now charge what they want. They're now a $6 billion company. And it was started off by a guy very early in the internet days, as the legend goes, who happened to be the first one who just registered www.realestate.com.au as, um, as a URL and built a $6 billion company. And that was $6 billion 10 years ago, so it's probably more. So they yes, they charge. And boy, oh boy, are they pushing that price point through the roof. Do they send? So it works the same way as here. The people, people the consumer, they go over there and they like a property and then the appointment goes over to the agent and then the agent pays a certain amount monthly or ah, a fee. Oh yeah, okay. So, but now what happened was it went from a monthly subscription model with all you can list to effectively, and they did this by having premium upgrades, but now because virtually all the other agents do the premium upgrade, it's become a thousand to $2,000 per listing model, per listing. So you so have to get, and this is another concept. It's a piece of the commission. Uh, well, and there's the other thing. It brings up another concept yeah. called seller paid advertising. Vendor, pay, vendor is the seller. The owner contributing to the advertising expenses up front, mm -hmm. as opposed to it being incurred by the agent and thus being part of the risk reward proposition. It's one okay. of the differences that justifies this 6% business. Yeah. Our sellers pay a commission, but they pay for advertising. That's the other piece that I was getting to, because we talked about this before, which was we're getting, if I'm an Australian listing agent, I go there, I get it at, let's say the max, 3%. But the, the seller is paying for the marketing. Correct. And how much typically is that? Uh, I, I used to have a rule of thumb 1% of the value of the property, but that was when we needed very expensive newspaper and magazine 
print collateral that was crazy. So for a $400,000 property, we'd attempt to get $4,000, etc. And rarely did we get it. We'd, we'd accept 1,500 to 2,000. Sometimes 500 would do a job, but that'd be more classified ads than pictorials, etc. So 1% used to be a good rule of thumb. For 10 years, it could be a fraction of that because of the advent of the low cost buyer acquisition of realestate.com. Now yep. it's creeping back up that on a $500,000 property, you've got to probably start at $3,000 to really start to make an impact. Because 1,500 of that is gonna to go to this realestate.com.au. Yeah. Then you need your sign board, your invites to the open for inspections, whether it's flyer drops, heaven forbid, Facebook advertising. Now most, and that's what I was getting at before when I talked about when I was in uh, uh, Beverly Hills in LA, last time I was there, and it was only a year and a half ago, the skill level that I saw of agents promoting their listings on social media was abysmal, and this is from LA real estate agents, because I was doing a deep dive in the opposition of of Flag and uh, they were the Douglas Elman. I think Joshua might have just changed to Compass, didn't he? Um, but yeah, the, the Altmans and, and and Flag and all of that, they were all with Douglas Elman. But Glenn Cortina was with Harcourts, the same brokerage as uh, Bob, the great man Bob Wolf, yeah. uh, who I, I I'm just still in love with this to this day. Got the biggest man crush ever on Bob Wolf. Um, so I was there looking at their competitors. Yeah. And mate, I tell you, what was your Facebook guy that I met a couple of years ago? Is Tim or Tom? Scott, Genius. Scott Shapiro. Scott Shapiro, Facebook guy? Ah, oh, I, oh, I do know Tom. Scott. I go, Tra who's the other guy? Travis. Travis Tom. Travis Tom. Those agents have not been listening to Travis. They are not advertising. They haven't been to Lab Coat Live. They yeah. they aren't advertising their properties well direct to consumer. So, and I think that's the art that might have been lost. I have a question then. So in total, it sounds like the seller is paying four percent let's on the, say on the yeah they're, they're not always getting the one percent yeah. like say yeah. 600 like and certainly as our property prices have had a bump since COVID, many places across the country just doubled i know i saw that they're not getting eight grand in an eight hundred thousand dollar property but they might be getting three four has anybody two. in your world ever gone in and said hey don't worry about the marketing i'll handle it and this is my charge yeah, um, often though that's added at the end and recouped. So it's almost like we're loaning the seller the advertising dollars, which again, yeah. and this is another legal thing, and I hate being boring like this, but what that does is the unfortunate thing, there are some legal experts, no one's ever gone down for this legally, but there are some legal experts that say that the agent incurring that financial uh, interest where they only recoup their advertising expenditure upon the property settling, gives no, them a conflicting interest to get that property sold at any price, thus being in conflict with the fiduciary obligation that they've incurred to get the most. Because now yeah. they've got some skin in the game, you know what I'm saying? So well, the answer is yeah. yes, they have, but that. So that's why it's, it's preferable to get that seller to dip their hand in the pocket up front. We've got about five minutes, but I have a really good question for you because Betty brought it up again. Betty, great questions. Uh, how does a listing agent handle multiple buyers? Like oh, multiple we love that, Tristan. That, that multiple that offers point? is my um, it's my kryptonite to be the best to go to it, it, the Pareto principle, whatever it is that Dr. Jordan yeah, Peterson yeah, talks Pareto. about. We talk about the eighty twenty rule. The twenty percent of negotiating skills that gets you eighty percent of the result of the best negotiator on planet Earth is mm -hmm. learning an effective multiple offers, multiple buyers situation. Mm -hmm. So that script, I do go through an hour training in, in my training, and I did put mm -hmm. together a link for you guys, for your guys, Tristan, um, and I'll show it in a moment if, if you like, where they'll get that hour long training along with my life's work, everything I've ever done. And I got Naomi to mark it down much to her dis like she didn't want to do it because I took the price down to 47 AU which is like 31 US and we sell it here discounted from 10 grand down to one grand. And when she said I discounted it down to like 30 bucks US, she was mad, <laughs> but she did yeah. it right. So, but the quick version of that is for Betty. I love it, Betty. Thank you. We go to each buyer, say I've got four people interested in the property. Mm -hmm. I go to Tristan, who's one of them. I say, Tristan, look, thanks for wanting to buy the property. I love that your kids had already picked out their bedrooms at the open house on Saturday. Mate, congrats. Let me see if I can get this for you. Um, I do need you to sign this piece of paperwork that just says you are in, we're gonna take all of the offers. I need this to be your best offer because I've got some of my colleagues who are signing up other offers. And this piece of paper is just a, a Real Estate Institute of Queensland official form 
it's important that I say official. So they are signing something that I have told them, your, I need your best offer right now. Because I, there, look, I've got some other agents, Tristan, I'm telling you, I've got this one yeah. guy, he's out of the military. He is so disciplined. He's better at this than me, right? He's out there, has a reputation within our office of getting outlandish prices. So I just need you to know that um, you're up against other buyers. So I need this to be the most you'll pay for this property. Fair enough. That's, so, dude, here, let me pause you. That sounds terrible for the buyers. It is. <laughs> I, I don't have an obligation to the buyers. That sounds like an absolute disaster for the buyers. It is when they're up against someone who can say that. Like, you notice how friendly I was saying it. Yeah. You notice how, how but, you know, I'm not but, being, but I am making no mistake that I'm saying, Tristan, my representation is to the, to the seller. And so if that other offer is more than the one that you're willing to pay, I need yeah. to be okay that you're not mad at me for not sort of saying, I mean, if, if say in the future, because what that other buyer, now this is part of the dialogue, and note how, and you'll be mad because it is against the buyer to get them to pay more money, which is my legal responsibility, but it's yeah. under the guise of friendliness, right? So, so Tristan, what, what that other buyer potentially might be paying, it'll be public record in about two or three months. And if you see that that amount was say $5,000 more, because I don't know what, what he's doing at the moment. He's signed it up now as we speak. That yeah. anonymity is important, by the way, just breaking role play. Sure. Um, if, it, if it turns out three months from now, you see it was five grand more and you missed out by like a cup of coffee a day, yeah. are you going to be mad that you kind of didn't have a chance to at least match it? You know, and look at my body language. I'm kind of doing that. If I see you even do that subtle little nod that you did then, right? Because I'm watching you because I know what I'm asking. I've asked it a thousand times when you nod even subtly like that. I'm going to go, so mate, look, maybe give me that 5,000. Let me see if I can get this for you. Right. So I'm having them negotiating against their own desire to own the property and a hypothetical fear of missing out. And I'm getting you and and and, and then I'll jokingly say, so Tristan, thank you for that five thousand, mate. I look, I'm gonna try and get this for you, but I do need to keep asking this to you until you get mad at me and you take that chair that you're sitting on, you throw it at the wall, and you say, for one dollar more, you military mate can choke on it. Right. So I'm jokingly saying, are we at that point? One guy, Tristan, I'll finish on this. I said to a guy, we're sitting there at a bar signing it up, right? Now we'd only had one drink, so we weren't in trouble legally. We weren't, I wouldn't sign up a drunk guy. We'd had one to drink, but I motioned to his wallet because we had a good rapport and I saw that there was at least one $50 note in there. I motioned to his wallet and I said, may I? And he said, yeah. I picked his, I, I got $152 out of his wallet, 152. And I said, let's put this on the offer. It just might be the difference maker. What do you think? And he laughed and said, right oh. So, I picked his pocket for his last $152 legally, almost as a joke. But then when I went back to the seller and I said, this was the negotiation process to get you the last penny in his pocket, you know? So you're right. It is, mate, everything is for the benefit of the seller. That's why yeah. we can't double end over here. There is no way I'm going to do my, I was called a smiling assassin back in our day, right? Because I was friendly and stuff. <laughs> but. I, I, but I used to, I mean, think about what I did before, Tristan. It's I'm terrible. sitting there edifying someone else's skill set, saying they're better than me. Glenn. And in doing that, I'm better than them. Glenn, this is, so I'm, I'm glad I talked to you and we're listening in because this, what you're showing us is where we'll probably end up Eventually. if we start tweaked because this becomes a serious issue if buyers start circ thinking they can circumvent and go directly to the seller. The listing agent only has a fiduciary to the actual listing seller. Uh, seller. And then that's where problems start with multiple offers. Betty, that was a great question. A thousand percent. Offers... And Tristan, if your guys are well-trained in that sort of smiling assassin type scripting, that is where you get seller testimonials with sellers in tears. Because that's the next thing. And there's a, maybe a round two of this discussion for, for yeah. you and me, Tristan. This means that you need to become the listing agent on mass because when you meet yeah. these lists, when you're the listing agent and buyers are coming direct to you, guess what they are when they have something to sell? The same buyer that you squeezed Listen. for their last $152 becomes Glenn. your selling client. Glenn, I don't know why NAR didn't call you to show up to the, <laughs> to the case, man. It's like, hey, uh, everyone here, the jury, just listen to how it's done in Australia for a minute, okay? 
And, and then you're going to go like, through round oh, two, bro. Oh, 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 shit. Okay, got it. Okay, taking note, Glenn. Because there's no confusion, <laughs> Tristan, and that's, I suppose, the thing. Is I even know there is confusion historically when there's two parties, or even when if there's one party trying to double end. How the hell can you differentiate yourself and say, Tristan, I put more money in your pocket as a seller and kind of say the same thing to the buyer? It can't be done. Where there yeah. is no, like when we've got, I've, I've had sellers in tears of gratitude to my clients who saved their financial life by getting them more money using these completely legal tactics that is the way that law should happen. I don't want a lawyer hoping there's a win for the criminal who is on the other side of the representation. You know, say it's a trial in, in any other court. When my lawyer is looking after me, I don't want them to be thinking about the best interest of the guy that's going to jail. You know? That's true. That's true. All right, Glenn. How do people get a hold of you if they have questions, if they want to grab anything on your part? Yeah, uh, do you want to um, maybe put it in the chat or do you want to just activate the screen sharing? Because I've got a link that if they want to, I'm going to help some some USA real estate agents. And the way I'm kind of going to pick the ones that want to work with me, and it's just, it's going to cost them nothing. It's going to cost them literally like 30 bucks. Um, gotcha. if, if they go to, it's www and they will have to put in the www. Wait, right? www. And, www.i want it all and let me see what are you seeing there Tristan? are you seeing all. my facebook or are you seeing my zoom i am seeing your zoom if you right, give me so, the site i yep. will oh, there it is so i want it that's all the site i want it all.com.au slash backdoor so as you can see if they see you anywhere online they have to thank you because my team oh, weren't happy that we dropped this down to 47 bucks and that's au and our dollars nonsense compared to yours so it's like 30 Wait, what's bucks that? And what's the site again? And uh, I, want I want it all dot com dot au slash backdoor. There, there you go. Okay. Let me. So that'll get my there. life's work, like gotcha. thousands yeah. of hours of all of this nonsense. There it is. And <laughs> and I'll work with them every week like this to get them up to speed with this. Because really, that's what we should do on step two of this, Tristan. Is how Listen, do you get twenty to I'll... thirty listings? Yeah, I li I'd like to focus on that. And also, um, it's very clear that from what you're telling me, buyers are getting screwed uh, over uh, here. Yeah. So, yeah. well, they're, they're getting, they, they think that they are better negotiators than they are. <laughs> thus, they are leaving themselves very vulnerable to people who are actually half decently trained negotiators. Isn't and it's the 80 20 rule you only have to be adequate at that one system, and you are brutally effective out there in a the marketplace. Dude, you got that. Thank you so much. Let's do, uh, as the settlement gets decided on, ah, by the, yeah. when when they start tweaking and saying, hey, this isn't going to fly, this is, or hey, this is what it looks like. Let's have another one of these because I'd mm. love to, I'd love to uh, showcase you yeah. and then your words. But, but even then, I suppose, Tristan, the one thing I would say is no matter what happens with that settlement, there is never a reason against being the local dominant force who gets all the listings in an area, no matter yeah. what. Because then you get all the buyers as well, and you're the, you're the listing dominant. There is no argument against it, even historically. You know, if you guys recorded and have available Lab Coat Live from San Diego, they should get that event, buy that off Tristan, and just watch my two sessions because that's all I focus on is how to get listings. I agree. All right, let's focus on that, how to get listings from Australia. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. To be continued, Tristan. Thanks, my man. Continued.